When Star Trek finished its original run on NBC on June 3rd, 1969, there had been 79 episodes. And 30 good ones, at least according to Philip J. Fry. But not every story conceived for the show made its way to the screen, often for pretty good reasons. As with all art, there is inevitably a good deal of intrigue for fans of what could have been. And from that scrap heap of partially developed stories and episode concepts, emerge a pack of interesting behind-the-scenes stories of the episodes that didn't come to be and why they were scrapped. Hey everyone, I'm Bree from Trek Culture, and these are 10 Star Trek episodes that were almost made. Number 10. Shoal. Darlene Hartman was a New Orleans-based writer who got her foot in the door on Star Trek by submitting four spec scripts. They were all rejected, but Gene Roddenberry saw something in her and invited her to pitch again, and eventually arrived at a story outline. In it, a landing party beams down to a verdant planet and discovers a small colony of artists whose every need is provided by something called Shoal. While down there, the crew discovers that the ecology of the planet is in complete balance. The natives are in perfect health, and there's no elderly among them, which is great. But then Ahura and Sulu end up dead, which is decidedly not great. McCoy and Scotty call Kirk to report that they've been found shot, but by the time Kirk arrives, they're both dead too. Kirk, filled with rage, sets off with a phaser to kill Shoal but is stopped at the last moment by Spock, who has deduced that the being is actually the collected consciousness of thousands of beings, including the dead Enterprise crew. After some classic Trek science-y exposition, Spock is able to return the crew from their afterlife of sorts before they all head home. However, after that had been decided, Kirk just, and I'm quoting here, makes a jerk of himself for the entire episode. So, the idea was scrapped. Number nine from the first day to the last. To explain the relationship between story editor John D.F. Black and Gene Roddenberry would be a video in and of itself. So let's just say it was way more than a bit Quark and Odo. When it became clear that the production of the show was lagging behind schedule, a plan was hatched to repurpose the show's pilot episode, complete with its almost entirely different cast, into a two-parter. Black called this version from the first day to the last. Taking place in a hearing room, the episode deals with whether or not Captain Pike can return to Talos IV, complete with clips from the cage, before a late episode twist reveals that the officer proceeding over the hearing is just a Talosian illusion. Now, if that sounds similar to the menagerie, it's because it is. There were several major differences, of course, but Black felt his contribution to the script entitled him to half the writing credit. Roddenberry disagreed, and the script went to arbitration, and... Well, to this day, it still just says, written by Gene Roddenberry. So you can kind of guess how that one went. Number 8. Japan Triumph. Oh boy, this one. Despite being released during Season 2, Gene L. Kuhn still contributed four episodes after his departure. Spock's Brain, Spectre of a Gun, Wink of an Eye, and Let That Be Your Last Battlefield. However, due to a commitment to produce the series It Takes the Thief, he had to abandon plans for a further two, 1 million BC, and Japan Triumph. No record has emerged to date regarding 1 million BC, but we know more about Japan Triumph, which was considered as a potential story idea all the way back in Season 1. This is another parallel Earth story, and this time it depicts the US in 1967, with Japan having quickly won the war in 1943. It plays as a sort of comedy show emphasizing George Takei, with the Japanese running America but now hating every moment of it. Contrast that with a defeated America actually enjoying life with their new imported victors doing all of the hard work for everybody. Given how poorly that would have aged, it's pretty thankful that it was never put to screen. Number 7. Sure Leave 2 Ted Sturgeon was a science fiction writer who, amongst other things, wrote two of the original series' most popular episodes, Amok Time and Shore Leave. He had a reputation for going past deadlines and ignoring budgetary constraints, but he was asked to contribute a third episode in the third season. This had the working title of Shore Leave 2. Some accounts claim it was a direct sequel to Shore Leave, while others claim it was a story that would later become the animated episode Once Upon a Planet. But in reality, it was a standalone episodic tale set on on the planet Lackaday. No, really. That was actually the planet's name. Chekhov gets robbed by a pickpocket, Sulu loses money in a shell game, 
Kirk gets into a fist fight. The crew meets a large man with a big ugly head and scar called Old Gorilla Grillo, and on and on with none of it making any sense whatsoever. The showrunners took a look at it and sent Sturgeon a memo saying it was great. Well, except for the fact it lacked a story, peril, conflict, and a single believable characterization. Number six, The Joy Machine. Technically, you get two episodes for the price of one here, as the spec script entitled The Root of Evil starts all of this off. The story was about a Federation planet where the inhabitants were all hooked up to a payday machine that rewards labor with the feeling of pure ecstasy. As a result, all anyone does on this planet is work. The original script set Ahura as the central character, which would have been amazing, until Gene Roddenberry stepped in and told the writers to keep in mind that our real money is Kirk, Spock, and McCoy. They obliged and went back to the drawing board and came up with the Joy Machine. So now, instead of Ahura meeting her old flame Danny, you had Kirk meeting his old flame, Danny. The final script was described as marvelous, but also lacking logical construction, correct characterization, and believability. And thus, the script got kicked around for years before the show was canceled and all possibilities of it being made were ended. Number 5. Bem. Pitched for the show's third season by the Trouble with Tribble scribe David Gerald, the premise was that an annoying, practical joking non human alien joins the Enterprise crew. Bem, a play on the acronym Bug Eyed Monsters, is a colony creature with parts that can detach and act independently. In fact, Gerald provided concept drawings for how the creature might look and a costume that might be built. After several very different and very plot-thin outlines were submitted, the idea was eventually canned. But a few years later, Gerald dusted off the script for the animated series episode Bem. The story ended up being completely different, and Bem itself is pretty underwhelming but at least it avoids the pitfalls of being Star Trek's answer to Scrappy-Doo. So, that's something. Number four, Joanna. Despite being one of the most iconic characters in all of Star Trek, all we really know about McCoy's life outside of the Enterprise sickbay is that one, he hates transporters. Oh, and two, Jadzia says he's real good at fingering. But Dorothy Fontana tried to shed some light on him by introducing an established daughter into the show. In her episode, some 23rd century flower children would be beaming onto the Enterprise, and one of them, played by, they hoped, Nancy Sinatra, or Bobby Gentry, would turn to McCoy and say, Hi, Dad. Joanna is part of a small, peaceful band that have accidentally wrecked their ship while looking for the mythical planet Nirvana. Eventually, they take over the Enterprise and find the planet, but it isn't what they expected. Now, again, if all this sounds familiar, it's because the story was reconceived and filmed as The Way to Eden, albeit without any references to McCoy having a daughter, of course. The producers decided that DeForest Kelly didn't look old enough to have a 21-year-old daughter. Oh, and if you're wondering if she was going to get the full Kirk treatment on board, the answer's almost definitely. Number three, he walked among us. Shortly after turning in his final draft of The Doomsday Machine, Norman Spinrad got a second assignment, He Walked Among Us, a story about a Federation psychosociologist who had crash-landed on a planet with a pre-industrial civilization, became revered to them as a god, and decided to establish his ideal society with them to vindicate his theories. Kirk, understandably aghast at this blatant violation of the Prime Directive, faces the dilemma of how to make Dr. Bain leave the planet without further violating the Prime Directive or contaminating the planet's society. Oh, and several notes were attached to the script stating the part was mostly being written for Milton Burley, literally Mr. Television. Sounds like a good idea, but when Spinrad turned in his first draft, associate producer Bob Justman sent Roddenberry a memo reading. No doubt you will remember that I made a statement about Norman Spinrad evidencing definite signs of becoming a highly skilled television writer. I would like to retract that opinion. Despite a sound concept, it was agreed that nothing really happened in this episode. And even if it did, the dialogue was unspeakably bad. Also, it required dozens of $200 silver wings, despite Spinrad being told the show was already heading over budget and needed to tighten the purse strings on this particular episode. Roddenberry and DC Fontana did eventually sit down and try and salvage the idea, but in the end, they decided to just bin it off instead. Number two, Tomorrow the Universe. 
Paul Schneider was a television veteran who wrote Balance of Terror and The Squire of Gothos, two classics from Star Trek's first season. But even the pros have their off days, and his third script for the series, Tomorrow the Universe, was an unimaginable disaster. Producer Bob Justman didn't mince any words when he read it, calling it undoubtedly a new low for professional writers. It was not produced. In the story, the inhabitants of planet Spurlos have transformed their society into a spitting image of Nazi Germany, complete with swastikas, tiger tanks, Sieg Hales, and even Adolf Hitler. It seems that several years before Kirk and company visited, another Federation starship was accidentally destroyed there, leaving behind a set of damaged historical tapes. Conveniently, they stop at 1941. And a sole survivor, a power-hungry half-Vulcan woman named Spin. And if, once again, you think that sounds vaguely familiar, you're probably thinking of Patterns of Force. It's a similar tale of a Nazi planet written by John Meredith Lucas for Star Trek's second season. When Schneider caught wind of the episode, he filed an arbitration claim with the Writers Guild, feeling his work had been used without credit, but the Guild sided against him. Once the matter was settled, Schneider sent a note of apology to Gene Roddenberry, but it's obvious he still held a grudge. On a copy of the script in his personal papers, a note appended by Schneider read, My original first draft, unproduced but later copied without giving me credit. Can someone say salty? And finally, number one, Portrait in Black and White. Lightning did not strike twice for Barry Trivers, who wrote the memorable The Conscious of Kings for Star Trek's first season. His sophomore effort was this proposed episode, in which the Enterprise visits another planet of hats. On this one, the hats they're wearing are all American Civil War caps. But the twist on this world is that it's a black population enslaving a white one. Kirk is captured as a runaway, but nothing much happens and no points are made other than the obvious one that slavery is bad. So, no kidding. NBC was not having any of it and said hell no. Not even approving the story outline to go to script. But Roddenberry had Trivers do a first draft anyway, but that apparently was terrible. Trivers doesn't deserve all the blame for this one, though. Gene Roddenberry came up with the story premise, which he called Congo, seriously, as part of his initial pitch for the series in 1964. Many sources claim Trek's heavy-handed Let That Be Your Last Battlefield was an evolution of the story, but the two are nothing alike. And Battlefield is arguably better, which gives the idea of just how much the other one stunk. So those were 10 episodes of Star Trek that never got made. Oh well. Let us know what you thought about him in the comments below. And while you're here, why not subscribe to Trek Culture? You're not doing anything else today, right? You can also follow me on Twitter at TrekkieBree and follow Trek Culture at Trek Culture. Until next time, I've been Bree, an actual human woman, and I'll see you next time.